I'm too young. <laughs> but at this rate, next year, I'll be at the top of the list. So I'll, I'll get in early. <laughs> Same for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll be there at the door, January the 2nd, next year. <laughs> Uh, I think we're probably almost ready to start. There are I 25 so. now, and if anybody else arrives, I'll just let that's, them in. But brilliant. I think it's probably about time to make a start. Mm -hmm. Before I start, I'll remind you, um, I am recording this, and hopefully we'll be able to sort that out afterwards and disseminate it to everybody. Uh, welcome to everybody. This is our first attempt at uh, Zoom. Um, if you wish to ask questions, use the chat facility at the bottom of your screens, you find the chat, and then you can we can read the questions out later on. And I'll mute everybody before we start the presentations to avoid background noise, but the speaker will be invited to unmute, obviously, and at the end, we'll unmute all, and again, we can chat if anybody wishes to carry on. Does anybody got any questions before we begin? Okay. Are you ready, Peter Maybury? Nobody is ready. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll mute all in a moment. Right. I'll mute all now. And you'll have to unmute. Are you able to unmute, Mike, uh, Peter? Right, yeah. Right, yeah, you're unmuted now. Okay. Okay, ready. so if you're ready then, share your screen, you carry on. We're going to get the first display from Peter Maber and the Canal du Midi, and then we'll have two smaller ones after that. So off you go, Peter. Thank you very much, Chris. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is just a... Uh, That out has been a, something of a fun um, collection. Right. Have you shared your screen yet? Yeah. Because we can't see it. Oh. Why? Should come up now. Can you hear me, Chris? I can hear you, but we can't see your screen yet. <clears throat> that's better. You okay right, now? You've, yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, you're in there now. So just go to your begin on your slides and away you go. Right, fine. Okay. Um, you go to, go to slide show at the top and then go to begin on the left so your thumbnails are removed. Me. Sorry, Chris, what did you say there? You need to remove your thumbnails on the left hand side. So go to slideshow on the top rim and then go into begin. That's it. Go to slideshow. And then go from, yeah, then go to the left from beginning. Right, got it. That's, That's it. it. That's okay. It. That's better. That's better. That's better. Okay. So. If anybody finds, if I just interrupt for a second, if anybody finds the gallery intruding on the right hand side of the top view options, you can hide the gallery. Okay, carry on, Peter. Right. A brief history of the Canal du Midi. Uh, in October 1666, Louis XIV signed the edict authorising the construction of a canal uh, designed to join the Atlantic Ocean to the Mediterranean, Le Canal des Deux Mers. 
Such an operation had been considered a couple of times previously in 1539 and 1598 um, by reason of transporting merchandise via the long and frequently hazard sea route uh, that uh, was caused by bad weather and Barbary pirates from southern France around the Iberian Peninsula to Bordeaux. So who was chosen to carry out this amazing feat of civil engineering? Obviously a respected engineer, but no, Pierre Paul Riquet, a tax collector, the farmer of the Gabelle or salt tax in Languedoc. He was appointed collector in 1630 and was also a munitions provider to the Catalonian army. Riquet became extremely wealthy and on being given permission by the king to levy his own taxes became even more wealthy. This in turn allowed him to execute grand projects with great technical expertise. He was created Baron de Montrepot in 1662 and he died in 1681, just nine months prior to the completion of the first section from Set to Toulouse. That was known as the Canal Royal de Languedoc. Following the revolution, the canal was nationalized and renamed Le Canal du Midi. In 1810, Napoleon created the first limited company of the canal and then sold off the state house shares to his family and friends. It was only in 1856 that the dream became reality. The Atlantic and the Mediterranean were joined with the completion of the Canal Lateral uh, à la Daron, from Toulouse to Cascade en at the head of the navigation, navigable um, stretch of the river Garonne. The, uh, the, 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 oh, the, the, what it's called then, the company Compagnie Centrale du Haut de la Garonne, operating small uh, steamships linking Castel to Bordeaux, with a variety of larger vessels serving the communities between Bordeaux and Saint Nazaire. In 1858, the uh, Compagnie des Chemins de Fer du Midi or just known as Midi in, in France, was granted a 40 year concession to operate the canal. That's just a rough outline of what the uh, area covered by this display. Here we have uh, a map showing the water sources necessary um, for maintaining the canal levels and this is uh, a 1666 map which is in the museum um, of the canal in uh, Ravel. Here he is the man himself, Rique. Um, His house, the Chateau de, uh, de Bonvapeau, is still in existence, but I believe it's in a pretty parlous state at the moment. Um, don't know why, because there are some, uh, there's a lot of interest in the canal in France. The first uh, cover I'm showing is of 1766 and uh, this is the time of the Canal Royal de Languedoc. This is to the um, Controller General or the um, Managing Director of the Canal in, uh, in Bézier.
the next one is a letter of the 1783 um, from one regional director to the uh, managing director uh, of the canal in, in Toulouse. Uh, Seventeen sixty five, uh, a letter to the um, Controller General in Toulouse, re uh, concern from local inhabitants about damage to their properties due to neglect to the section of the of the canal bank. Uh, business correspondence entrusted to a bargee along with the, with the freight. Um, this is dated 1786 and uh, is just before, three years before, the um, nationalisation of the canal by the Revolutionary Council in Paris, who then renamed it. Uh, the Canal du Midi. Seventeen ninety one, another um, letter consignment note carried uh, again by uh, Margie. Seventeen ninety two. Um, this is a letter from a barge, um, barge captain posted at Toulouse to some merchants in uh, in Agde, and um, setting out a proposed itinerary for um, carriers for the transport of rather a lot of grain. Interestingly enough, the hand stamp, the Toulouse hand stamp, um, is one that is not recorded uh, by Potion for 1792. The, uh, a bill of lading uh, for a cargo uh, valued at 11,750 livres, which is a hell of a lot of money, um, from Toulouse to Agde. Again, endorsed with the barge captain's uh, name. 1805. Um, uh, a bulletin of, of the uh, rules and laws um, from Napoleon the first and uh, concerning changes um, universal changes in France to the uh, charges and measurements um, for the for the canal. This was a period when um, Napoleon took over the, the canal and started to flood off um, shares to, to his family and friends. 1806. This is a, quite an interesting letter. It's um, from the postmaster in Ravel, which is where the um, uh, the Canal Museum is well worth a visit um, to the director of the canal at Toulouse uh, expressing his concerns about local children uh, going in up to the reservoir 
uh, and swimming in it, which she considers to be quite dangerous. The other interesting part is that um, even though the postmaster at Prevel applied the hand stamp there, he didn't make any charge. He sent it to his uh, friend, uh, the postmaster at, um, at, at Toulouse. And it was then delivered free, again, free of charge. This is definitely a case of fraud as postmasters were forbidden in the uh, Instruction Generale to use the free service for private correspondence. An 1806 letter um, to a regional business manager at Toulouse. Uh, And a similar item, um, now bound to Toulouse, but uh, interestingly saying that uh, he will be searching for a larger warehouse and sending goods by wagon um, until a section of the canal is made more navigable. This one, a uh, letter of 1829, as it concerns a dispute over eight wagon loans of sand removed from the banks of the canal, um, allegedly without authority. Eighteen thirty four consignment note um, from the managers of the Battle Post, Silveron, in Toulouse, uh, for carriage by, of merchandise to Bordeaux by the fixed day delivery service. This is interesting, of course, because. Um, the canal did not join up to the Garonne until 1856, and so uh, it, it would have had an interesting route. The 18, uh, an 1826 letter from the uh, director of the canal in Paris, where the head office was um, at uh, 12 Rue du Doyen. An invoice for um, Food, <coughs> uh, meals taken on board the canal, a canal steamship um, addressed to Montpellier. With a nice uh, hand stamp uh, of the Canal du Midi um, office in set. There were one or two um, branch canals uh, from Nidhi to um, reach the centre of towns, um, bigger towns. Um, for instance, in this one, the Canal de la Pabine, um which joined the Canal du Midi to uh, to Narbonne, the contemporary 
uh, temporary card of uh, picture home, I think. It's obviously um, being carried by uh, by a mail service on the uh, on the canal. This is a, a an advertisement from the uh, a local newspaper in 1841, advertising the sailings um, of a steamship on the canal um, for sailings between Ajan and Bordeaux. And the plan of the um, of the port at Ajan. Oh well. Well, no. Um, 1856. This is the year that the um, Yeah, the, this was the, the year that the canal was actually completed, so you could uh, you could sail um, from Bordeaux right down the full length of the of the canal, um, and this is uh, from the <coughs> what the section of the uh, of the canal which is uh, known as the transport accéléré. Um, and the um, steamship office uh, of the canal. Someone out there will recognize this. Um, this is another consignment note of, the, of 1856, uh, being carried by a steam barge uh, from Toulouse to Aix on the guarantee five day journey, but not including the days of departure and delivery. Quite a nice engraving. In 1858, the canal was leased to the railway company, uh, Jimmy D, um, which effectively was the beginning of the end um, of, the, of the canal uh, as much of the uh, business was transferred to the rail, railway um, from the canal instead of on the canal. Now we have um, a few. A, uh, slides of um, contemporary postcards. This first one is the uh, a, a lot the uh, the source one of the sources in uh, a mountain range, the um, Black Mountain. Uh, Here it is again, uh, and this shows a profile of the canal at, uh, at the highest point. The Fonseran locks, um, eight lock chambers and with nine gates 
uh, an amazing feat of engineering. And uh, it's interesting that this particular construction was uh, subcon subcontracted. Uh, but very, 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 very clever. Some horse drawn barges. Steam power barges. The steam tug there, I mean, my God, it looks wicked, that. Yeah. Uh, pleasure. Uh, cruising on the canal um, in the early days and the uh, in <laughs> 60 years later. Now this is a contemporary um, Uh, engraving of the canal bridge um, which was originally constructed 1802 to, between 1802 and 1810 um, and uh, quite interesting to see the difference And um, this is a very, the uh, an engraving taken from the Le Mans in 1857. And that, folks, is the end. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. There is one question from Peter Rook. Is there any evidence that the canal was used for troop and naval personnel movements during the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars? Uh, not that I know of. Not that I know of, but it would seem a fairly logical thing to happen. Why, has he got something? I don't know. I just want him to unmute. Peter? No. <laughs> Have you come across anything, Peter? No, I haven't. Can you uh, hear me? No. Yeah. I've, no, I've on, not, never come across anything. It was just having seen the sea to sea link and uh, knowing what was happening in the Bay of Biscay, etc., whether in fact there were troop, um, particularly naval personnel, were transferred from the Atlantic into the Mediterranean. But it was just, um, just really a, a query. All oh, right, okay. Mm. Yeah, uh, well, at that time, I don't think there was. Um, uh, 18, 18, 18, yeah, it might just have been towards the end, but um, there was no, there was no, um, Easy connection, no, no. Um, for, in the northern section of it, to um, to Bordeaux. Right. Yeah. And just bearing in mind the number of days and weeks and months that, in fact, um, quite a substantial part of the French navy was trapped in the in the entrance to Bordeaux there. Mm. So. But, um, anyway, okay. Anyway, then, right. So. <laughs> Thank you for the Maybe, display, if you'd like to stop sharing your screen, please. <clears throat> and then we can move on to our next presentation, which will be by Mick Bister. Are you ready, Mick? Well, I'm just sharing screen. Right. Do I need to unmute you? Um, I've done. I'm unmuted. You've unmuted. That's all right. That's fine. Yeah, okay. lost it.
Yeah, no, you're there. We can yeah, see. Uh, so just, just go from beginning. I'm sorry, I've got to close my gallery. I think that's what's happened. That's better. Yeah, okay. Yeah, from beginning and then with that, yeah. That's okay. it. Yeah, okay. Right. There. Right, um, this presentation is on the 1 franc 50 issue of 1942, portraying Philippe Pétain, uh, Marshal of France, an honour bestowed on him in 1918, after he had led the French army to, to victory at, at Verdun. But from that we, we, we jump 22 years later to 1940, after the Germans had broken through the Allied defences, and Pétain was called to be advisor to the Minister of War. And as the situation deteriorated, uh, Pétain's influence increased. Uh, he replaced uh, Paul Reynaud as the Prime Minister, and with the surrender of France, he replaced Albert Lebrun as head of state and established the seat of government at uh, Vichy. He was 84 years old when the photograph on the left was taken. The stamp on the right was designed by Jean-Eugène Bercier and engraved by Jules Piel. It is likely that the portrait of Pétain in this stamp was based on the one in the photograph. If you compare the lighting, for example, on the forehead and the front of the face, they are very, very similar. Bercier's uh, artwork on the left is a gouache and Indian ink uh, and is the only stamp that he ever designed. It is currently housed in the archives of the Musée de la Poste in Paris. Note that the only inscription is Poste Française as the Third Republic had ended with the fall of France. On the far right are two proofs pulled on coloured paper and signed by the engraver Jules Piel. In contrast to Bercier, the artist, um, Piel's uh, output of engraving was more than 150 French stamps between, one, uh, between 1933 and 1966. So Piel was much more prolific than Bercier. In the centre is um, a die proof pulled in the uh, atelier of the state uh, printed works. It's not one of Piel's private ones. Uh, this slide uh, shows on the left uh, a document which is known as the Bonatire, authorising the printing of the 1 franc 50 in its designated colour, brown. It uh, comprises a colour proof attached to a sheet of paper with the seal of the state printing mm -hmm. work. The insert on the right displays uh, the annotations. First of all, you have the date of authorization, 19th of January, 1942. The value, one franc 50, which represented the internal letter rate. The signature has not been identified, or at least I've not been able to. It may be that of a junior minister in Paris as Jean Bertolo, the Minister of Post and Telecommunications, was in Vichy with Pétain and the rest of the cabinet. In the bottom right-hand corner, in pencil, is the number 729, which is the ink number. And the initials, uh, JFB and RC, that have been stamped on, are those of the two experts, um, Jean-Francois Brun. And if I've got the pronunciation right, um, uh, Roger Calves, or it might just be Roger Calves, I know somebody will correct me. Um, both of them, I think, think it was in the 1980s, were invited to authenticate all the documents being held in the Musée de la Poste. Um, now we come to the printings themselves. Each revolution of the cylinder printed two sheets of 100 stamps. At the top from the left, um, we see the first day of printing the 28th of January, 1942. Next to it, a later printing signed by the engraver, Jules Piel in the right-hand margin. And the one uh, right-hand side of the top row, a printing of the 11th of November, 1943. Um, normally Armistice Day was a public holiday in France. 
but obviously ceased to be so during the German occupation. Um, nevertheless, only a few presses operated uh, on that day with uh, a skeleton staff. The, the, the bottom row shows um, further examples, particularly to demonstrate uh, ink shades, which were inconsistent because of, uh, of, of supplies during the war. But one worthy of mention is the last one there of May 1944, printed in, printed in what is quite clearly a bright reddish, reddish brown. I'll proceed to explain that. Um, because here we've got two items again from the Musée de la Poste. Um, on the uh, left, what we've got here, in fact, are termed as feuille modèle. And the feuille modèle is a sheet uh, onto which is recorded the accession number of the stamp and other data um, deemed useful or important by the atelier. Um, if there is an official change of format in the stamp from sheet to booklet, etc., or value or type or colour, a second feuille modèle is created. On the left is the first feuille modèle created from a sheet printed on the 2nd of February 1942 in the original brown ink and registered as so on the 14th of February 1942, which you can see in the enlargement of the cachet at the bottom there. But on the right is a second feuille modèle, printed on the 12th of May 1944 in the new reddish brown shade and registered as such on the 16th of May 1944. Now, in my mind, this later shade, having been accorded its own feuille modèle, should be recognised and catalogued catalog as, a, as a separate issue. Just as we've seen, for example, with the 25 centime uh, cameo sewer with its um, distinct shades of blue. Um, here we see two black printings. Uh, on the left is a printing on thick cream paper to create, its purpose is to create underlays or cousine d'impression. The block at the bottom shows how the underlays are cut out. In this case, it's part of the face. And these are used to dress the impression cylinder or support cylinder, it's sometimes called, to equalize the distribution of pressure and thereby attain a more uniform printing. On the right is a test printing on uh, pink paper to check corrections made to the plates. And in the margin on the right hand side, it's signed by the engineer uh, on uh, the 7th of January 1943. Now one or two varieties. Uh, this is quite a spectacular one. It's a printing malfunction where the strip of paper on the right has attached itself, it was blank at the time, to the cylinder during the printing process and has prevented the transfer of ink. Um, it's now become detached, leaving that blank area behind. And I find it quite remarkable that both the sheet and the offending foreign body have, uh, have survived together. Um, another quite spectacular item is this, which is known as an impression sur accord. And this is where the printing uh, has continued over the paper join. The, the join could have been the result of a paper tear or the need to join two reels together. And the two pink sonnet little strips of paper either side of the sheet have been attached to alert the checker uh, so that the sheet can be withdrawn and destroyed. The, the, the two sonnets as well as the join itself, as you can see from the uh, enlargement, have, uh, have also been inked over by the, by the design. As I said, this sheet should have been um, withdrawn and destroyed, but I think we um, can term it as, de uh, determine it as an out of the back door item or dropped off the lorry item. Um, further varieties. Uh, at the top of the screen, we can see a malfunction that's taken place on press number five. The perforation 
process has staggered to a halt, producing the gradual deterioration of the perforation from full to partial and to imperf. By partial, I mean um, the uh, there are two rows there by the, uh, the, the, the dot in the margin where the perforation is simply indentations into the paper. Uh, the bottom of the, the screen we have examples of impression recto verso printing on both sides of the sheet. Um, when a sheet tears, ink is transferred onto the impression cylinder underneath from where the ink is then picked up on the back of the paper when printing resumes. And the block on the left is imperf, and the pair on the right, which uh, is, uh, you see is perforated. Um, here we see on the left uh, uh, a sheet of British, British intelligence forgeries that were produced by the Special Operations Executive for agents going to France. These were printed by Waterloo and Sons in October 1942. And they were given to agents, just did two or three stamps to put into their wallets, so that if they were searched upon their arrival, it would at least look as though they'd been in France for some time to have stamps there. And also we've got here the only postal stationary item produced which was produced was this private order for the Urban and La Seine Insurance Company. Um, there are two types of this envelope known, and they are identifiable by their different uh, different fonts. Their fonts. Um, there were no coil printings, but there were booklet printings, and at the top is an example of a booklet with marginal bars uh, printed. These were printed from the 1st of April 1942, and this example here is the first day of printing. Uh, and below, from July 1942, the remaining booklets were printed with marginal advertising, promoting the activities and achievements of the Secours National. Um, initially created during World War I, the Secours National was a charity relaunched by Marshal Pepin in 1940 its principal role being to support French prisoners of war and their families. And you can also see uh, a nice imperf pair superimposed. Um, one means of raising funds for the Secours National was adding surcharges to stamps. And in this case, it's 50 centimes on the one franc 50 pétain. Uh, a wide variety of settings and fonts and ink colours for the surgar surcharge as well as the stamp were prepared for consideration. Um, the two full proofs that you've got, you can see that from my own collection, but the two extracts are from, again, the Musée de la Poste um, archives. Um, again, in the bottom right hand corner of the proofs, you can see the penciled ink numbers, the top number being the uh, colour of the stamp and the bottom number being the colour of the, the surcharge. And here are the stages leading to the final issue of the Secours National overprint. Um, from the top left we have uh, a trial printing of the chosen surcharge in black on pink paper and to the right a trial printing in black on the normal stamp in brown. Now this stamp is invariably catalogued or listed in auctions as an unissued stamp. This is totally incorrect. Such a combination of colours, the original brown and black, was never considered for issue. It was definitely just a trial printing. In the bottom row, um, we see an imperf printing of the support stamp in blue and a perforated printing of the same. Next, we have a proof of the support stamp in blue with the surcharge applied in carmine, a very bright carmine. And finally, the first day of printing of the issued stamp 
on the 12th of August 1942, which has a slightly duller a car model in. And to finish off, at the top left, we have the last day of printing of the one franc 50 pitta, the 9th of June 1944, just three days after D-Day. Um, now, most sources, published sources, still quote the 8th of June as the last day of printing. But to my knowledge, the 9th of June printing, which I have here, is only to be found amongst the Bordeaux liberation issues that were overprinted on remainder stock. So clearly, uh, the, the post office in Bordeaux must have received the last printings um, from, uh, from Paris, uh, which were kept, uh, kept until this particular time when they're going to overprint them. And lo and behold, the 9th of, of, uh, of June appeared. So I'm lucky to have, uh, to have got that piece. Um, from the 1st of November, 1944, uh, all patent stamps were demonetized, even if they had the liberation surcharge. In this case, it's the Leon one. The last day of use was therefore the 31st of October, 1944, as shown here, top right. After that date, mail franked with a patent issue was refused, returned to sender or to the dead letter letter office. Uh, so this one at the, the bottom here, bottom left, shows all the inscriptions you might find on such an envelope. The stamp has not been cancelled. You've got the cachet timbre, inadmis retour à l'envoyeur. Um, you've got the tape uh, which for the letter to be opened to check the sender, but then the sender's dress has then been crossed out. So there must have been something or, uh, funny there, because when you look at the back of the envelope, you've got, you see the envelope says um, Lyon Rebu, so it's been sent to the dead letter office. And that's what, the 6th of November. So that was six days after the uh, stamp had been demonetized. Just to, to, to finalize, I, after that date, um, after the war, but, uh, beg your pardon, um, Paytown, uh, Laval, etc., uh, were tried for treason and sentenced to death. In the case of Pétain, though, upon the intervention of Charles de Gaulle, the sentence was committed to, to life imprisonment on the Ile Dieu, where he died in 1951, aged 95. He is still buried there, but you've still got the people who remember him as the Lion de Verdun and would like to see him buried in the Pantheon with the other heroes of France. All right, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. My story of the one franc fifty Peter. Chris? Thank you very much, um, Rick. That was an incredible display of one small stamp. <laughs> yes. There's a long flat list. Yeah, I like varieties when you can see them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, those are fly specs. <laughs> They're not fly specs, definitely They're not fly specs. They're not fly specs, though. No. We haven't got any questions. I think you've explained everything very, very fully. So if you'd like to stop sharing your screen, okay. yep. move on to our last display, which will be by Steve Ellis. Are you there, Steve? I am, yes. You're muted, ready to go. Okay, so if you start, um, that's it, you're off. A display of mobile boxes or movable boxes, whichever you prefer. Okay. How's that look? You still got the thumbnails on the left. So go to slideshow. Yeah, that's better. That's better. Is that better? Yeah, that's it. That's it. You're there. You're there. You just jump once uh, on there. You go back to your beginning. Tell, tell me again what you want me to do. I think you're on your second slide, I think. I think you need oh, yes, yes, yes. Right. 
I've lost my... Uh... If you right click on the PowerPoint, you can usually go previous to get back to the... Uh, yeah, you, okay, Rob, you, uh, go right through it then and then come back to the beginning. If you, that might there be. we go. Sorry. Yes, all right. Okay. Right, you're back at the beginning. Uh... That's your last one, I think. Yeah. I think you come back to the end there. Right, so if you go back to the beginning, that's it. And then go back to begin. That's it. Okay. Yeah, but we still got the thumbnails on the left. So just go to slideshow and then to the left to begin. But don't jump more than one slide forward. Yeah, from beginning. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Oh, well, yeah. Good. Thank you, everyone. There you are. We're there. So um, this display really is just a snapshot. It's a snapshot of 12 slides, which I've, I've taken from uh, a much larger display on the Boat Mobiles uh, and I've converted them into PowerPoint. And I've, I've, the, the 12 I've selected are to kind of show a variety of uses um, of the Boat Mobile. Um, it's important, I think, to, to just, just check on what we mean by the terminology. The Boatmobile, the, the true translation in English, is a movable box. It's not a mobile box. A mobile box might have been a post box which was on a ship and moved with the ship. But the movable box is different. It would have started probably um, at a fixed location, such as the gangplank of a boat, the box is then moved on to the ship and continues to accept mail uh, and it stays with the vessel until um, when it arrives at its destination the whole box is taken off the ship and moved to a post office where it's emptied. That um, is, is my um, understanding of the correct uh, terminology for the movable box or this is a French display of so the boîte mobile. And obviously it was used for um, late mail. Now, not surprising that the first example I've chosen is the one which is most normally um, uh, known for automobiles, and that's on the cross-channel uh, mail, maritime mail going across the channel. The use of these boxes was first authorised by the 1843 Franco-British Postal Convention. And, and if you know anything about them, the, the early caches were generally the boxed rectangular MB uh, applied on arrival at the British ports. But the one I've chosen to show you to illustrate this is, is, um, is a slightly later one, the 1850s. It's carried between Southampton and La It's the, what we call the tombstone um, box. I like this one particularly because it is a, a good example of a, a boat mobile, but it's also a very interesting example of transatlantic carriage, but that's for uh, another time. Um, so, so that's the, uh, the, first, uh, the, first, the first slide. Now let's stay with the cross-channel element. And uh, the um, what mobile cancellations were in use between the Channel Islands and the French ports. Um, these these were really by the turn of the century. Uh, they were in use on most of the these services from the Channel Islands. Um, they were often circular cancellations, as on the right, or octog octagonal cancellations on the left and had the word, uh, had the letters A-N-G-L, um, referring to Angleterre, of course. Um, and the two examples that I've shown are for, uh, were applied at Granville and Saint-Malo um, on the uh, services operating into the French ports from, from the Channel Islands. But of course, before that time, even from the 1840s, um, the French had uh, movable boxes on their steamers op operating um, 
operating on the uh, the northern from the northern ports. That's really strange because at the top of the sheet it says Maritime Channel Islands. Well, I corrected that late last night. So why why that hasn't taken? I don't know. I apologise for that. So from Onfleur, Trouville, Ken, uh, Cherbourg, Saint Malo, and, and Molay, um, linked with Le Havre. Um, you often, you, well, you, you do see in this case, there were terminate, there were, the terms used were bateau à vapeur or variants on that, bateau à vap or bateau à vapeur or bateau à vap, uh, different variations. Um, but um, the one on, on the left is, I suppose, particularly interesting because that was cancelled with uh, an incorrect um, uh, port the the names of the ports indicate the port of departure so this was hastily found to be wrong and corrected um, on arrival at lava so you've got two uh, different um, points shown one crossed out of course which tends to indicate that all that all the cancellations whichever whether they were outbound from lava or inbound to lava, bear in mind what I said, that the name of the port indicated is that of the departure, they were probably almost certainly applied at lava. Um, another example of maritime um, movable boxes uh, was from on the services out of Marseille to North Africa. And there were a number of different types used there. The one I've chosen to illustrate is the one between Marseille and Philippeville, which is a double lined uh, rectangular boxed uh, BM, which you see um, used uh, in later, uh, later examples of cancellations. But they were, they were in use on the service to Algiers and Oran, and as well as Philippeville and Bone and uh, set also. See how we're doing for time, yeah, good. And the final maritime one that I, I've selected, and we've just jumped to second one. I'm sorry about that. I'm going to wish through them again, forgive me. I've, I've lost the line on the left-hand side. Here we go. I have a gallery view of all of them, but it had disappeared. There we go. Apologies. Uh, you, you might say this was fluvial, I suppose, or uh, uh, river. Um, in my view, it's probably still maritime because uh, several estuaries um, had um, uh, steamer services on. This is the one of the on the Loire. I've chosen as example operating between Nantes and Pambeuf. Um I've chosen it because it, it, it gives a couple of different um, what mobile uh, caches the one on the right is is a is an early one uh, uh, again a boxed one but the one on the left is particularly interesting because it's manuscript and was used before the caches were first introduced um the uh, does, that, does that make sense uh, we've got on the left we've got the manuscript uh, one saying that it's been found in the box on the boat and then uh, an early um, watchmobile cache used on the Loire service. And move uh, on to onto land. You know, uh, what 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 often isn't appreciated is that. Um, hey, uh, are you able to remove your thumbnails at the left? You're. The, you're the pictures. Yeah, you're only showing part of your screen at the minute, aren't we? We've seen the screen and the thumbnails on the left-hand side. 
There we are. Who's that? No. Chris doesn't need, need, Chris doesn't need to go into slide show again. Yeah, on the top right and slide show is what, which, what controls it. Right. I've just, I've just moved. They're, they've gone on mine. They haven't gone on yours. New. No, it's not desperate. It just means we're only seeing a little bit at the top of the show. So what should I do for you to see them removed? Click on slide draw again. Yeah. And then current slide. Now click on slide show again, and then you see on the left hand side, it will say from, you got a little thing that says from, yeah, click on that. Yeah. Now to the left there, from current slide. Yeah, got it. That's yeah. it. Right. That's it. That's better. Brilliant. That's it. it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this is an important part of the story, really, because Watmobiles existed on land land based services can be slightly complicated. Um, what what applied was in rural areas, the French post office would uh, award contracts to private entrepreneurs who were called uh, courier d'entreprise, and they would be given a contract to carry the mail, usually on a movable vehicle. Um, it could, could have been a, a horse on occasions, but usually a mo movable vehicle. They carried a box on that vehicle, which in the same way as on the ships, would have mail put into it. And then on arrival at the nearest post office, uh, the box would be taken off, handed over to the post office, and there it would be emptied. Um, it's it's important. Well, let me just explain first of all that the caches that were introduced initially had Broughtmobile and then the name of the town uh, on it. it. It is important where you can to try and establish where the letter was written or the postcard later on. And it, it, using maps, if you can establish that that was at a slightly distant point from the post office cancellation, then the likelihood is that it was carried on a courier d'entreprise, um, not as I say, normally from a rural area. Just going to explain that a bit more on the next slide. Of course, um, it helps. Um, I happen to have a, an atlas which was produced by the post office which shows all the contracts which were issued um, to courier d'entreprise. So you can, you can tell um, if there was one actually operating between two points. Um, as I say, it is important to get this clue, if you can, from where it was initially posted. Now, by this time, you can see that there is a, an oval BM uh, cache, which is the one which we see nine and a half times out of ten. That's because as the, as the service took off using these courier entreprises from the rural areas, um, it became impossible to keep producing the cancellations for every single post office. And so they abandoned the named Watmobile um, ca cancellations and moved to uh, the one with the BM. As I say, it, it is helpful if you can check, the, as a double check, um, you can look at these maps and find out uh, exactly where the, um, where the contracts were let. You do have a couple of oddities, and this is just one that I've chosen at, at um, uh, Nantes Station, for example, there was a, a, a box at the station which was moved once a day by a courier entreprise operating on a contract to the railway station. And for that service, a particular uh, cache uh, cancellation, not uh, what um, either one or two was, was used. Um, and that's important because you often see 
um, a BM a cache together with a station cache. And, and don't be confused by that because um, in most cases, it, it simply means that the uh, mail was carried on a, on a courier entreprise, a rural courier entreprise to the station and the BM was applied to signify that journey. What we're now beginning to talk about is mail that was, was taken specifically to a railway station. And here, here's another example of that. You need to prove that the automobile cashier was actually applied at the station. Now, some stations had a bureau gar installed within the station buildings and from 1868 the mail there was handled by an entreposeur and he was a postal sub-agent as distinct from a post office employee. Now that's an important distinction when you're considering whether the mail was received via the automobile at the station if this was so, then the same rules applied. The box wasn't fixed in a fixed location at the station and just emptied. It was moved. It needed to be a movable box and opened um, and specifically uh, the BM applied, cache applied. And often you see in those cases, Garde, in this case Dax, which was an example where this where they supplied the mail. The mail was then taken to the, um, the the train, if you like, at the station for onward carriage. Again, it's important to look to where the letter was written. Uh, as we said with the courier entrepreneurs, sometimes you will get the name of the little village or small hamlet, which was different from the post office. So it was carried by the uh, courier entrepreneurs in the automobile from this small place actually to the post office. But sometimes you had the movable boxes at the stations, and in which case um, it, you can tell from the cancellation on the stamp that it's not the same point from which the letter was written at, if you're following uh, what I'm saying. So uh, look inside the letter uh, and um, the letter in this case was uh, was uh, written at Port Vardra, but that's not the cancellation on the stamp. The, um, the letter was carried on a courier convoyeur, that's like a very small TPO, um, that was carried by the courier convoyeur. He applied the BM cachet. Again, for proof of this, you can look at the um, you could look at the post and telegraphic um, atlas for all the contracts that they let. And there is in fact a contract let to carry mail from Port Vendra um, on the railway. And this is a, a good example of that. You be and of course in this case you've got the lovely, um, you've got the lovely um, courier convoyer station Port Vendra cancellation the Angela or the Wiggly, um, one down in the bottom left hand side. Um, a very nice example, but you you've got to be sure with the railways of of um, exactly what happened. And so uh, we'll just have two final ones. Uh, from 1877, what mobile could be carried on a voiture publique, which included uh, Paris trams. And here's an example of a box um, on a tramway, um, which was then taken to the post office um, nearest to the terminus of the tramway service and handed in. Here's a good example, which again, through research, you can, by looking at where the letter was written and where it was carried to, you can actually find the tram line. In this case, I think uh, Route uh, 6A, Paris tram. And uh, it was the terminus of the tram was at Rue de Rennes. And sure enough, the post office is at 53 Rue de Rennes. In this case, interestingly, from a double point of 
a point of view, it was then uh, handed in and carried on the pneumatic service in Paris. And finally, I've, I've given you an example of a, a foreign uh, automobile. Um, here we've got the French Guinea uh, service between uh, Conakry and Ramu, and uh, a boxed uh, BM uh, cash in the, in the centre. Um, and from the messages written on the postcards, because uh, I've looked at a few of these, uh, a number appear clearly to have been written en route or at different dates from the postal cancellation. And so um, one can be fairly certain that the um, letters were posted into the automobile, carried on the train, and then taken to the post office at the Conakry terminus where they were cancelled at a date later than when they were written. Um, if you're interested, this line uh, commenced its uh, construction in 1900 and reached Mamu in 1908. So there's a, a very uh, a brief look at, um, at the varying uses of the Boatmobiles and an explanation as how they came to be applied. And also, I think, an explanation of the things that you need to be aware of when uh, making sure that you've got exactly the correct explanation. Thank you. Steve? Yes? Um, I'm not sure I've got this right, but fairly early on in your... Um, hello? <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yeah, the sound's breaking a little, but carry on. Okay. Um, I think I saw that you've got North Africa, um, a 1903 cover. Um, yeah. Did you say it was carried by the Messageries Imperiale? Sorry, say it again. Did you say that it was carried by the Messagerie Imperiale? Yes, they had a contract to to up